subscribe to our YouTube channel and press the bell icon to get the latest updates. National interest this week is staying with the COVID tragedy and the challenges it's causing for the Indian state and the state of the government in India and the quality of its response to this big challenge. But before I go there, I will tell you thank you very much. I had told you a couple of weeks back that we were starting a new feature for our subscribers called Your Turn, where our subscribers get an exclusive platform to write their opinions. I am really gratified as are my colleagues with the response we've got. The first edition of Your Turn is published today. Please see how these opinions have come out. The, we will improve the presentation, etc. as we go along. But please keep your views coming in and also when you send your views, particularly as you write them like an article, I told you this is your chance to destroy the opinion industry only for our subscribers. Please also send us a picture of yours wherever possible. We will use your pictures as well. And if you have any social media handles, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, please tell us those so we can also tag you and we'll also share those on social media. Every week I will share the three that I consider the most important or more inter most interesting on my Twitter and Facebook handles as well. So thank you very much for writing it. Now back to national interest. National interest this week examines what kind of a situation we have in India. What kind of a government do we have in India? What kind of a state do we have in India? So this is sparked by the latest India Today cover story on the cover India Today calls India a failed state. A failed state because, because of the way the entire COVID situation has gone out of control. It doesn't look like anybody's in control. It looks like every person for themselves because everybody is now on social media asking for help or giving each other help. So is India a failed state? Certainly. News magazine India Today, which was my alma mater for 12 years between 1983 and 95, that thinks so, that thinks so, but I would humbly disagree. We are not a failed state yet. Because if we were a failed state, then this publication would not have said so on its cover and I wouldn't be writing this article or speaking about this on camera as I am doing right now. If India was a failed state already, we might, we might not have known how badly we were failing. As long as the nation's own media, civil society, even individual cit citizens are free to bring the bad news to all, hold the mirror to the most powerful ruler in our country in at, at least four decades, if not longer, we are not a failed state yet. But we are not a perfect state. So what are we then? I might then opt for a more apt description, a flailing state, writhing in pain, tossing about in desperation, helplessness, confused, chaotic, poorly led, on the verge of a disaster, but still looking for answers. So not failed because it is still looking for answers and debating as we do right now. Flailing state, therefore, is a better characterization of India today, not the magazine, India today. And it is such a pity that I didn't invent this expression. This expression was invented by economist Lant Pritchett who is currently research director at the Blavatnik School of Government at University of Oxford. And this, he used this line, expression he used in his much quoted, off quoted 2009 paper at Harvard Kennedy School, provocatively titled, Is India a Flailing State? Detours on the Four Lane Highway to Modernization. Now, important point is, he said this in 2009. When UPA was at its peak, it had got re-elected and it had given us a red hot epoch of growth. So at that point, he pointed out that look, while India is growing and India is in this highway to modernization, India will suffer because of its weak state capacity. Today, if you see, is that state capacity any better? In fact, if there is one thing this COVID crisis is exposed, it is India's really doddering state capacity in every area of delivery, particularly in a crisis, in a big national crisis. Now, take you back to 2009. After 2009, the second term of UPA was quite chaotic. It was confused. The quality of governance did slid steeply. The government was paralyzed with contradictions and indecision. As the state flailed 
even harder narendra modi rose to seize the moment and promised to change it it was around 2009 10 that he began to announce his arrival as a national leader minimum government maximum governance that was his promise and people believed him and of an uncertain dithering state people thought let us now go to a more decisive one through seven years of economic stall though under narendra modi his voters have kept the faith in him although the economy has not done well it has stalled and now lately for the past 3 years it's been declining until but people still kept the faith in him until now when this virus came back and exposed the reality that after 7 years under modi india is still in an unprecedentedly dysfunctional worse flailing state and this helpless helplessness is what's coming out and i i'm quite sure has also reflected in the results in west bengal and up panchayat elections this is also a vote against lack of quality governance now the state our state quote and quote the top leadership its institutions including the bureaucracy the scientific estab- establishment are all either missing in action or scurrying about to cover up or somehow airbrush the image not change the reality so you think like say things like oh we have the largest number of vaccinations or second largest or you don't say that only 3% of my population is vaccinated twice and just about 10% or 11% is vaccinated even once you don't say that so that is called air brushing or you say i have tested 30 crore people which is the record but at the same time you don't admit that we are short of so short of rt pcr testing now that icmr icmr has actually issued guidelines that once a person tests positive there is no need in fact the labs are no longer allowed to test that person a second time because rt pcr tests are in short supply so this also entails the risk that somebody who might think i am okay but is still shedding the virus could be going around uh, mixing with the community but this is being done because nobody wants to admit public <coughs> that we are short of testing kits now every leader has their key brand propositions modi's besides hindutva and hard nationalism included administrative ability execution and efficient delivery of welfare infrastructure building now we've seen some of that in the past 7 years to be fair we've seen very efficient delivery of welfare to the very poor uh, through using jam trinity using aadhar using technology uh banking channel stuff like that that's been quite efficient and that also resulted in his higher numbers in the 2019 elections despite poor economic growth second we have seen the construction of hard infrastructures highways ports airports etc that definitely has come up but the foundations of basic governance were not strengthened if anything it looks like they've been weakened because many institutions are weakened and when we say institutions are weakened we are not necessarily talking about judiciary media election commission we are talking about the central institutions of governance not even oversight and what is the most important central institution of governance it is the cabinet system because in a normal cabinet system by this time the best the most efficient and effective the most towering members of the cabinet would have been handed over the responsibility of this crisis response because this is a national emergency that's not being done right now and at the same time those ministers who may have failed on the job would have been shown the door in such a grave national crisis you don't put your politics or a personal likes and dislikes ahead of your large citizenries large populations life and death issues that's what india faces right now now we'll give you some example from our own political history of when it was done so i know that supporters of narendra modi and bjp who are in much larger numbers now than supporters of any other leader in india at this point they get triggered if you mention jawaharlal nehru but let's mention jawaharlal nehru at least in a moment of defeat in 1962 he lost the war to the chinese what did he do he accepted the fact that he had lost the war he fired his defense minister vk krishna menon and brought in bai b chavan with his strongman maratha reputation or maratha strongman reputation in no time bai b chavan got down to the job soon enough he launched indian armed forces first five year plan for modernization and we saw the results already in in the 1965 war similarly lal bahadur shastri inherited from jawaharlal nehru 
one terrible national humiliation and crisis that was food shortages starvation famines dependence on american wheat imports lots of other food imports and foreign aid so what did he do he for this agriculture minister found c subramanian who was a surprise but he was somebody who was very modern forward looking not involved in petty politics not so concerned about winning winning elections uh, playing this caste versus that caste in the hindi heartland so he focused on agriculture indira gandhi when she took over from, from shastri allowed subramanian to continue by 1969 we saw the green revolution then i may jump four decades you jump four decades you come to 2008 2611 again a big humiliation for india when those terrorists came and they had a free run in mumbai shooting up the top brass of mumbai police killing people in many key places two big hotels so on and so forth and that is when our home minister shivraj patel was found wanting in the job also he made statements made appearances that did not convince people that actually irritated people and did not at all add to their sense of security so what did manmohan singh do he removed him because he had failed on the job and he replaced him with p chidambaram the fact is that institutions like nia national investigating agency and ntro national technical resource organization these institutions were set up by him as home minister and today the bjp lays such store by them so once again this is an example of when you accept a reality you can fix it i jumped four <clears throat> decades but i can take you back again to 1991 look at narsimha rao he found that when he took over india india's economy was close to bankruptcy india was on the verge of a balance of payments crisis chandrashekhar had already mortgaged india's gold the gold had been flown in by Air India aircraft. At that point, what did Narsim Rao do? Horses for courses. He went out of politics, and he found Manmohan Singh to be his finance minister, and also allowed him the space to function, take decisions, and to fix that economy. So, all these situations, the leader of the day accepted that something was wrong, that it wasn't going to be possible for him to fix it. and found somebody with the ability to do so so we are not making a call to fire this minister or hire that because personalities in such big national crises don't matter issues matter so let's list the crucial ones that made these hard decisions that i just listed listed for you possible the number one that there was an honest acceptance that something had gone wrong unless you accept failure you cannot address it unless you accept the diagnosis of a disease that one of us might have got we cannot start treating it so accepting the reality is the first step number 2 there was no compulsion to ring ring fence the top leader or leadership 1962 everybody blamed jawaharlal nehru even people in the congress party at that point number 3 there was no desperation to give all the credit to one leader for everything because that requires a constant declaration of victory because if you keep on giving credit for everything to one leader then how do you protect that leader from blame when things go wrong that is a contradictory situation because if you have to give all the credit to one leader you then require a constant declaration of victory which means you cannot accept the reality of a setback at each of these junctures there wasn't an almighty cult of psychophancy now we know that indian politics has seen a lot of phases of psychophancy there was dk barua indra's india phase in rajiv gandhi's time also there were kalpanath rai k k tiwari so all those phases were there but we did not then have ministers writing multiple tweets a day hailing the prime minister for every aircraft landing and disgorging foreign aid we may call it friendship and presuming that their job was done whereas this aid was only made necessary because of their failure with their own portfolios the way they are getting away and the way the prime minister has retreated, retreated into some kind of a silence is adding to this disaster it's a government in denial its defense ranges from our average per million deaths are still much lower than britain or us or that this is an awful foreign variant that nobody knew anything about 
or that look at the size of our population we are still vaccinating more than any other country in the world except maybe the us and we'll soon catch up with the us one call from the pm and see uh, help is landing from all over the world one one nudge from the pm and see how biden has lifted iprs on the vaccines etc now the latest is that this wave is now plateauing and the crisis will be over soon this i am afraid is a suspension of collective disbelief and it's going to be dangerous it's time now for some humility only that can lead to a larger national conciliation and a unity of purpose what kind of humility i am afraid i will have to invoke nehru again although this time there will be a probable consolation for those who don't like nehru i take you back to the book freedom at midnight which many of you would have read by dominic lapier and larry collins and i am also sharing with you the relevant pages of the book with you both uh, both as a link with the description but also on the screen now in the book the document an event when punjab was burning with partition riots and the fires reached delhi it seems that nehru went to uh, mount batten who was the viceroy and said look we can't handle this we were not trained in governance while you were governing the country you were either agitating or protesting we know that we never learned to govern or we were spending time in your jail so when did we have the time to learn to govern you come and help us so you set up a special committee a cabinet committee which you had and you help us get over this crisis <coughs> mount batten tried to say that how can you do it you've just become independent but nehru and there was one more leader with him they said look but we understand that we are not able to handle this so the authors quote that as an example of large heartedness and humility an act of statesmanship so mount batten did actually constitute an, an emergency council which he headed in that period of crisis now this book then drew, drew much protest from congress and demands to ban it but the authors noted this as an act of large heartedness now we are not suggesting certainly that modi do any such thing that he go to somebody and say can you run the government in my place no no such thing we are not we are not delusional we are not saying any such thing i am not nuts uh, but he needs to reach out to talent with his, his within his own party he has to accept that this crew has failed so far and even elsewhere and he has to take the opposition opposition into confidence call for maybe a cessation, cessation of hostilities for now build a joint federal front of the center and the states stop this name calling between them and douse this fire for all this first we need an acceptance of the enormity of the crisis if not failure it will need that one attribute that we haven't seen in his governance so far that is called humility it will not bring about a dramatic solution a flailing state will not suddenly become a solid performing state because our problems are deeply structural i accept that terrible things can stuff large complex poor populous nations but it is how you respond to these crises that distinguishes a politician from a leader and i promised you a compensation so in my postscript i tell you that who was the leader who accompanied jawarlal nehru when he went to mount batten to ask if he could help them run the government in india in that time of partition crisis and that time of bloodletting it was none else than sardar vallabhbhai patel